and welcome back to the show. Vaccine hesitant New Yorkers are considering leaving the city as COVID mandates take effect. Now, some unvaccinated Bronx residents would rather pursue a life outside of New York City than actually be forced to take the vaccine. As of March, over 33,000 New Yorkers permanently relocated to Florida, which is up to 32% from the same period last year. Joining us now to share more details is the freelance reporter and master's candidate at the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism, Bahar Ostadan. And now thank you, Bahar, for being with us. Thank you for having me, appreciate it. You know, it's an interesting statistic and when you really think about it, you say, okay, some people don't wanna take the vaccine, got it. But to say that you're actually leaving the state of New York, uh, that's some pretty interesting news. Absolutely. Um, I mean, like you said, we've already seen an influx of New Yorkers moving to Florida more so than usual um, throughout the pandemic. People seeking, you know, looser COVID restrictions and wanting to send their kids to school in person as opposed to virtually. So we'll have to wait for the data to come in to see how many people actually did leave the city as a result of these mandates, not only to Florida, but to neighboring, um, you know, Connecticut or Pennsylvania or other places that people might have family networks. We know also that, I mean, Connecticut and the tri-state area, they really haven't adopted that policy as of yet. No, no telling as to whether or not uh, they actually will. I know that you've done some reporting really specifically on this whole vaccine hesitancy issue. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you found in your reporting. Sure. Um, so I think the fact that people are leaving is really indicative of a larger problem and a larger question of why people are hesitant to get the vaccine. Um, so my approach was really just to talk to as many people as would speak to me going door to door um, where people are, you know, laundromats, hair salons, um, lines, anywhere people are waiting and willing to talk and just ask them, you know, what are their thoughts around the vaccine? Um, and if they're not vaccinated, what are the reasons for that? Um, a few things surfaced in my interviews with people. I guess the first that is really troubling, especially someone who works in media is um, people seem to be ingesting a lot of inaccurate information um, and regurgitating that to their network. So the rumors that we've been hearing about, um, you know, the vaccine affecting fertility or the vaccine itself killing people, which which we know are are not accurate, um, are really prevalent in a lot of neighborhoods. And so that's that's really worrying people. Um, and so that's causing people to actually fear the vaccine, I think, more than the virus itself, um, you know, which, which is a big problem. And I think there's a lot of work to be done to, to come back. That's going around. So you would say there's a, a, a great spread of misinformation amongst the people that you're hearing when it comes to really uh, details about the vaccine. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think um, what's unique about the Bronx in New York, as we know, is that um, this is a group of people, uh, you know, New Yorkers, the residents of the Bronx that are really different from people in other parts of the country who are against the vaccine and also against the mask and also, you know, might be denying the virus itself. So that's not the group that we're talking about here. These are people that um, were really, really affected tragically by the virus. Um, and most of the people that I interviewed actually did lose, have lost loved ones to COVID themselves. Um, and even so, like I said, are more fearful of the, the vaccine than they are of the virus. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot more reporting that, that needs to be done to unpack all of this. Um, I think it would be really interesting to report on someone's journey from you know, the day that the vaccines were actually released and follow what was their decision making like, what information were they presented with, you know, had they seen doctors, did they have access to, to people giving them accurate information um, so that we can start to understand some of the shortcomings here in terms of um, medical systems and local government. You know, I found there's an interesting statistic as it pertains to the Bronx. When you talk about Bronxites and those who actually with boots on the ground, who are residents of the Bronx, a lot of people who actually live in the borough of the Bronx are actually essential workers. And when you talk about this vaccine hesitancy, you're looking at essential workers per se, who are saying, even though we're on the front lines, we still have some hesitancy here. Absolutely. 
Um, I, I think that question too um, drives us to the question of who had access to the vaccine when it was first released. And um, some essential workers did for that reason, but a lot of people couldn't take time off of work to get the vaccine, to recover from the vaccine. You know, they didn't have the medical benefits um, or, you know, the technological infrastructure to go and find those appointments and the time to sit and you know, scroll and hunt for the appointments uh, the way that a lot of other New Yorkers had the privilege to do. Um, and so I, I think it begs the question of sort of how does access drive hesitancy? Um, and that's something that I don't think has been addressed so deeply in, in the mainstream media. I think there's, um, you know, you, you see a lot of mainstream outlets po pointing to historical um, medical harms like the Tuskegee experiment and sort of evading the present day medical harms and the present day um, shortcomings and how, um, you know, a lot of neighborhoods in the Bronx are really medically under-resourced in terms of even number of, of general practitioners. So where does your reporting take you from here? Obviously, these are some very key statistics and uh, startling in some ways when you look at the fact that uh, a lot of people, and you say 32% more than actually uh, this time last year, are heading particularly to Florida. Uh, where does your work take you next? Yeah, that's a, I have the same question myself. <laughs> um, I have been trying to keep in touch with the people that I interviewed and just check in with them. You know, hey, have you, have you decided to leave? Um, you know, some of the people that I interviewed did, in fact, uh, you know, they chose to stay unvaccinated and lose their jobs. Um, a lot of them are starting trying to start sort of small businesses at home with, you know, graphic design and other things that they can do remotely. Um, but I, I definitely will continue to try to talk to as many people as I can, like you said, with, with boots on the ground, because, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's sort of a dangerous situation when, um, as we know, the Bronx, at least in terms of national media and even New York City wide publications is a really undercovered borough. Um, and the danger of that is that when it is covered, um, you know, the way in which it's covered carries a lot more weight. And so I think as much as I can and as much as uh, we can as, as reporters to talk to as many people and represent, um, you know, how people are really feeling is, is important to getting the truth out. Yeah. Well, Bahar Osadan, thank you so much for being with us, sharing some very vital information. Of course, we too will continue to follow the story. We'll probably get you back here to uh, give us some more details if you have some more findings. But thank you for so much for joining us. Great. Thank you so much. It was great chatting with you. No worries. And listen, if you want to find out more information about her work, please go to her website, baharostadon.com. Why don't you stay with us? we got more show coming up. Open continues right after this. <laughs> 